You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 162 The Evil Eye. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Pretty good. We had a busy week. We did. What did we do? Yeah, what did we do? <laughs> what did we did we... all sorts of strange stuff. Yeah, I, th- I, I for those who haven't seen it, I posted a picture of me and Mike on our Facebook podcast page. So if you want to go take a look of uh, evil the one in the chair, the, the one in the suit. Oh, the one in the suit. Okay. Yeah. All right. My wife has been posting, inst- you know, stuff on my Instagram account too. We had the one with you and me in the chair. Yeah, yeah, but I know what you're talking about. Go ahead and tell them what you're talking about. Well, Bigfoot. I was. I get. To, I got to play Bigfoot in one of the episodes. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were filming for Fringe Pop. And if I think you're a I, newsletter subscriber, you know what that is. I think I scared Mike on how <laughs> much of a good interpretation of Bigfoot I do. Yeah, kind of like interpretive dance, right? You're just. <laughs> hey, I make a really good Bigfoot. It's almost yeah, second yeah, nature. He, I was just hoping he'd fit in the suit, you know? Yeah. Well, this Trey's a big guy. I, I managed to do it and it fit perfectly. It was, it was a lot of fun. So Yeah, it was. Mike, when are we going to get to see those episodes? Or just tell us more about the Fringe Pop. Yeah, if you're a newsletter subscriber, you know what this is. Uh, if you're not, uh, I'll give you the basics of it. Uh, Fringe Pop will be a TV show. It'll be it'll have a Roku channel, and of course YouTube, some other outlets. But it's basically a a response show, a video show to all sorts of fringy topics. You know, I I blog on Paleo Babble. You know, weird stuff that people believe about the ancient world. Then UFO religions again, how people make that into their faith or alternative belief system. So Fringe Pop sort of combines that. So we're, we're, we're trying to make short episodes, video episodes on, you know, helping people to, to just parse a subject, you know, one of these fringe topics a little bit better. And, you know, some of them will have, will be a series, you know, we're, we're going to do other episodes on Bigfoot. We did Bigfoot DNA. That was the one Trey was in his, uh, his starring role. He was born to play the role of <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bigfoot in that one. Yes, sir. But we did, uh, I think we got, oh, eight or nine, something like that, episodes filmed. But this was the studio that we've been putting together uh, in McKinney, Texas, so near Dallas. So we went back there and, uh, you know, thanks to everybody that helped out, especially Pat, of course, our videographer, Brian, you know, my wife, uh, she had fun putting makeup on my face. She said that would be the perfect Father's Day gift, by the way, getting me makeup. So, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but anyway... It was fun. You know, you'll know, you see more about it. If, if you want to know more about it, see more pictures, you got to subscribe to the newsletter. Or you can go to our f- Facebook page. I did a Facebook yeah, Live some... video of the studio. Mike gave us a quick video, uh, a tour yeah. of, the video, uh, of the studio. So go check that out if you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike, can I wear that Bigfoot costume to Roswell? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd fit right in there. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Of course, it'll be 110 degrees out, so I'm not sure that you're going to enjoy that. Everybody's going to be going UFOs. I'm going to go against the grain and go Bigfoot. Yeah, I don't know what go. that's going to do, but you know, chances are, if you put it on at night, you just sort of wander into the parade. You know, nobody's going to say anything. They'll just figure you belong there. There you go. So, what's going on in <laughs> Roswell? Oh yeah, Roswell is going to be. Uh, let's see, June 28. I don't know what it was. 29, 30, and July 1 and 2. So that that's the the four day conference event. I'm I'm part of a of a conference at the Roswell UFO Festival, which I have done three uh, previous times. I, I don't think I've been in Roswell for probably boy seven eight years. It's it's something like that. It feels kind of long, but yeah, we'll be back there this year. It's the 70th anniversary. Natalina is going to be there. You know, it, Trey's going to be there. We're just going to have a uh, going to try to get get something together for a paranormal episode as well. I have a, you know, one person in particular I'd especially like to interview, but it, it, it'll be a fun trip. We'll try to do some stuff for the podcast, that, that particular podcast. And then again, try to inject uh, some sanity into the Roswell stuff, but it's always fun. You know, I, if, if, if anybody's interested in this kind of thing, even peripherally, 
and you have kids especially yeah i'd I'd say it, it it's not a bad vacation you know they have uh they have stuff for kids to do it's kind of like a street fair atmosphere and and hey it's roswell you know there's lots of funny things kind of crazy things to see i feel like it would be going back to my roots because that's where i first discovered you mike shout out to guy for putting on that <laughs> conference in 2003 ancient of days or whatever it was called back then but that's where i first learned of you and, were you there uh, no, I was not there, uh, okay. but I found But you stuff. got like the DVDs or yeah. something? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, on the internet, got the DVDs, all that stuff. So uh, thanks to Guy Malone. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I Guy's the one history. behind, mm -hmm. yeah, he's he's the one behind our event. I mean, there, there's always two or three conference events that are kind of going on uh, simultaneously. They overlap a little bit, but, you know, it's it's four days and it's all day long. So people usually get to see what they want to see and go hear this or that person. All right. Well, good deal. Well, before we get started, you've got one more thing you want to tell us about, about your book, Reverse and Hermon. Oh yeah. It's, it's available now on Kindle. And for those of you who are Logos Bible software users, they, I got an email, I, I posted it, boy, it's probably a day or two old now, something like that. But, um, it's available for Logos Bible software users in the Logos format on pre-order so that the, the product itself, you know, isn't ready for immediate drop. Those of you who are Logos users, you know, sort of know what I'm talking about here, but you can get it on pre-order. And like I said, when I posted it, make it part of your data mining experience. Lots of good uh, verse references, cross references, references to other literature in there. It's it's a great kind of book to have in a fully searchable format. So, yeah, I'd recommend it if you're a Logos user. All right, Mike, can you tell what I'm doing? No. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Can't you're see looking it. at me. Huh? Yeah, oh, the yeah. evil eye, right? Oh, well. Yeah. Can you feel it? No, I, I really can't. Oh, geez. I need to work on it. Then. That must be what I ate this morning. You know, well, I don't think it's the evil eye. Well, maybe you're going to tell me what I'm doing wrong in this episode here. So I'll. Yeah, yeah. This is this is kind of an odd one. This is an an interesting topic. Uh, you know, I I don't know how many. It was several months ago that I got an email, uh, and I've gotten more than one. Uh, interestingly enough, about you know, hey, can you do something on the evil eye, or you know, do you have anything on the evil eye? Uh, idea. So, you know, when, when we finished Ezekiel looking for topics, we thought, Hey, you know, why not, why not throw this one in, in here? I I'm, I'm relatively new to the, to the ancient near Eastern biblical uh, connections to it. I mean, the, the concept I was familiar with, but in terms of the specific overlaps, that was a bit new, but it, it's really interesting. So I'm glad we're doing a, an episode on it. Um, by way of just, you know, getting into it here, I'm going to read a little selection from, um, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, because it actually has some uh, some information on this, and and it's it's basic. It's a good place to start. We're going to get into a lot more detail, but uh, that's the source. Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, uh, edited by Leland Riken, and it's the entry says the notion of the evil eye that is common throughout most religious traditions is notably absent from the Bible. Though Galatians three one may be a veiled reference, uh, unquote. Now I'm going to I'm going to not really go out on too much of a limb to say that is a dramatic understatement, and and to some extent misinformed. You know what what they're really getting at here is in this entry, and I, I I'll, well I'll read a little bit more. You know just so that you get a flavor for what we're talking about here. It because it after saying oh it's not there in the Bible they have a whole bunch of verse references. <laughs> Uh, to different things, and some of them will hit. But the entry continues and says, Nowhere is this view of the magical power inherent in the observer's eye more evident than in the almost universal ancient belief in the power of the evil eye. I'll just stop with that sentence. Well, if it's universal, you know, we might want to think that, you know, there, there, there's also something here in the biblical framework about it, rather than just say it's not present. So again, that that first part of the of the entry is is pretty uh, dramatically understated, really underinformed, but continuing. Some people, uh, it was thought, could bring about calamity by casting a spell with an evil eye. The expression of jealous sentiments or even compliments were viewed as harboring vengeful spirits that would subsequently destroy what had been admired. 
In accordance with this outlook, the phrase evil eye in scripture is usually rendered conceptually as jealousy. Wait a minute, let's stop there, stop the presses. You mean the phrase evil eye does occur in scripture? Uh, in fact, it does. Um, and again, that might sound odd because again, as the entry says, oh, this isn't in the Bible anywhere. What, what they're really talking about is this magical view of it. The phrase evil eye does occur in scripture. We're going to go through those passages in this episode. Uh, the, the notion that somehow there's some sort of supernatural or spooky power in it that that is you know sort of emitted or transferred onto the person either from the person doing it or to the person being looked at that that's what the entry is really sort of being cautious maybe even overly cautious about but the phrase actually does show up so back to the quotation in accordance with this outlook, the phrase evil eye in scripture is usually rendered conceptually as jealousy. The literal phrase is, thine eye evil because I am good, Matthew 20, 15 AV. Well, that's nice. That's kind of an awkward literal rendering of one verse. But as we see, with it, the, the, the phrase shows up in other places. The evil eye, or the eye betrays the inner spirit and may be selfish and hoarding or bountiful and generous. Eyes can be sharpened like weapons, Job 16, 9, and narrowed to a threatening squint. A few verse references there. The eyes communicate the whole range of human emotions, suspicion, haughtiness, arrogance, humility, pity, so on and so forth. And the rest of the entry is sort of like that. What is, you know, references to the eye in scripture, you know, just a person's eyes generally. But what we want to focus on is this actual idea and then, and then again, the, the, the phrase where it shows up in either the Old or the New Testament. Now, there's a context for this, and I think it's important that we say something about the context before we try to jump into the, into the Bible. And I'm quoting here, referencing anyway, the, uh, an article called The Evil Eye in Mesopotamia. This is Marie-Louise Thompson, who, was a, who I think still is, uh, a Sumerian scholar. And her, this, this article was in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies in 1992. So she writes just a few excerpts from this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly lengthy article, but just left a few quotations out of it. She says that someone, just by looking through a kind of witchcraft or power of the eyes, may cause harm to another person, animal, or object, seems to be an almost universal belief known as the evil eye, unquote. Now, Thompson goes on to go through a number of instances where there are specific incantations in Mesopotamian literature against the evil eye, basically to protect someone from it. And she writes about those incantations, quote, these incantations all indicate that the evil eye was associated with witchcraft and sorcery and other evils caused by malevolent human beings. But whereas witchcraft most often resulted in conflicts with family and neighbors, serious illness, or even death, the effects of the evil eye seem to be somewhat different. In one collection, the cuneiform texts from the Louvre, uh, number 1689, they are described as accidents. You know, in other words, the, the evil eye can cause these things, accidents, situations which might happen to anyone at any time like it raining too little, or the cheese making goes wrong, or a tool breaks, or clothes get torn, and so on and so forth. So what she's saying here is that the evil eye in Mesopotamian thinking didn't have to be this awful, malevolent, disastrous, catastrophic kind of thing. The evil eye in, in their thinking was something they could blame for almost anything that went wrong, you know, everyday occurrences. Now, let me go down here. I want to include one other thing here. She says, in the Near East today, eye imitations made of glass are worn as amulets against the evil eye. So even in modern times, beads resembling an eye or a pair of eyes are known from ancient Mesopotamia and are often understood as such amulets. The texts, however, prescribe other remedies. Means to protect against the evil eye are described in various incantations, unquote. Now, Yamauchi, who is a—I think he's retired now, but Yamauchi uh, is an evangelical scholar or was an evangelical scholar. He taught at the University of uh, Miami in Ohio. In Tyndale Bulletin, he has an article 
called Magic in the Biblical World. And this one, I believe, is publicly accessible uh, online. And he talks about the evil eye there. So again, this we're just setting some context here before we jump into some passages. Yamauchi writes, A widespread superstition both in antiquity and at present is the fear of the evil eye. That is, the concept that someone can cause harm by his baleful glance. The usual motive for this form of black magic is envy. Now, that's an important statement, as we'll note as we go on. The usual motive is envy. Occasions of gaiety and unusual success are especially thought to excite the resentment of those less fortunate. Any unnatural or diseased eye, as well, was especially considered an evil eye. So if you had some kind of problem with your eye, people would look at you, oh, they're, they're, that guy has an evil eye. Yamauchi continues, the black magic of the evil eye and the defensive white magic against it are already attested in ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt. From Arslan Tash in Syria, an amulet against the evil eye was published in 1971. I actually had to translate this thing in graduate school. Again, it, it, he, he's correct. You know, there's, there's some, in, in this particular inscription, there's something about you know, warding off the evil eye. He continues and says, we have rabbinical references to the evil eye. Rabbi Arika, and I, I'm assuming that is not a typo for Akiva, but we'll just go with what, what Yamauchi's article has here. Rabbi Arika went so far as to aver that 99 of 100 people died because of the evil eye. An exception to the ban on work on the Sabbath was the uttering of a spell against the evil eye. You could do that. That wasn't too much work. A man could take his right thumb in the left hand and vice versa and say for protection, I, person, son of another person, come from the seed of Joseph against whom the evil eye has no power, unquote. The belief persisted among Jews in the Middle Ages. Rashi reported that a man could call his handsome son Ethiop, that's E-T-H-I-O-P, which was the equivalent of the N-word in antiquity. He could, a man could call his handsome son that name to avoid the envious evil eye, which is kind of weird. Yamauchi adds, it is quite clear that fear of the evil eye continued through the Christian era, as evidenced by numerous amulets, paintings, and mosaics. A mosaic from Antioch, for example, shows the evil eye being attacked by various animals and weapons. One aspect of the hostile relations between Christians and Jews was the suspicion that Jews had this malevolent magical power. The canon of Elvira, number 49, dated to 305 AD, forbade Jews from standing and ripening grain, lest they cause the crops to wither by their gaze, unquote. That's the end of Yamauchi's section. So, you know, Yamauchi talks about this rabbinical, you know, the r r rabbinical belief in this, and then the Christian belief, and the, and the Christians are, you know, in 305 in this edict, forbade Jews from standing and ripening grain lest they look at it and it die, you know, because they had the evil eye. So it, it's kind of apparent, you know, that you had Jews and, and Christians, they, they bought into this idea, which was a, a wider, you know, cultural idea. One last uh, source, and I'll bring this one up uh, again, uh, Fiency, that's F-I-E-N-S-Y, uh, in his article, which we'll reference on the episode page says, Greek literature is also full of references to the evil eye. In a lengthy discussion in Momita, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, M-O-M-I-T-A, Plutarch tries to give a rationalistic explanation for why the evil eye is effective. He says there are emanations of particles, he maintains, from all bodies, especially living bodies. The eye gives off these particles most abundantly. And here, here is the passage. Indeed, I said you yourself are on the right track of the cause of the effectiveness of the evil eye. When you come to the emanations of the bodies, and by far living things are more likely to give out such things because of their warmth and movement, and probably these emanations are especially given out through the eyes, unquote. So, you know, it's, it's a passage that where, where you have Plutarch essentially buying into this notion that bodies, living bodies, living organisms give off, you know, something, emanations, he calls them, and the, and the eyes are especially good at this. And so that's his attempted scientific explanation for the, the efficacy, the effectiveness of the evil eye. Now, the question that, that this raises, of course, is, is there anything in the Bible that really draws on these ideas? And curiously enough, there are a few things that, you know, again, seem to I don't know if draw on is the right word, but seem to reflect 
the same sort of notions again minus minus the emanations you know this like energy being projected from the eye good or evil and that kind of stuff minus that sort of talk and minus um you know the, the notion that um there was some sort of spiritual power or spiritual energy being emitted against someone else so minus that sort of idea you do have references in scripture that that sort of again reflect the general idea uh, of someone giving someone else the evil eye and 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 having it actually sort of mean something or or effect something in some way now I'll, i will have this article as well referenced uh, on the the episode page and i will include it uh, in the protected folder uh, for newsletter subscribers but nicole telford or tilford excuse me uh, wrote a really interesting article in this called The Affective, that's spelled with an A, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, The Affective I, colon, Reexamining a Biblical Idiom. That's the end of the, the, the title. And the source is Biblical Interpretation, Volume 23, 2015. Uh, her article, The Affective I, Reexamining a Biblical Idiom, she, she goes through in both testaments, you know, the, the passages in in a decent amount of detail for this this belief again how certain passages in, in scripture reflect this notion that you know someone could could look at you or look a, a certain way at you and it 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 affected you in some way now of course again we, we don't have this sort of um you know kind of paganistic idea that that we're we're again emitting energy particles or bolts or emanations or whatever you know that 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 you can actually um you, you, it's not like your eye is weaponized, okay? But nevertheless, there are passages that reflect this idea that the way a person looks at you can and does affect you and others in certain ways. And and that, again, reflects the, the, the broader notion that harm to someone else can be caused by the way someone looks at them or the, the way you would look at them, that, that they can actually be affected you know, in this process, in this way. So Tilford uh, sort of begins her, her treatment this way. She says, throughout the 20th century, scholars were quite comfortable asserting that the ancient Israelites believed in the existence of the evil eye. Anthropological studies have proven that pre-industrial cultures around the world share a nearly universal belief that, quote, certain individuals, animals, demons, or gods had the power of casting a spell or causing some damaging effect upon every object, inanimate or animate, upon which their glance fell, unquote. That ancient Near Eastern cultures were among the earliest examples of this belief, and the Hebrew Bible is specifically mentions an evil eye, for example, Proverbs 23.6, Proverbs 28.22, and also mentions to do bad with the eye. That's Deuteronomy 15.9 and also verse 28, or excuse me, Deuteronomy 15.9, Deuteronomy 28, 54 and 56. That we have these instances, Tilford writes, seem to confirm that the belief was prevalent in ancient Israel. In the words of John Eliot, the evil eye was thought to be, quote, one of the most pervasive and enduring elements of ancient culture, unquote. And the ancient Israelites, quote, were no exception, unquote. Some scholars, however, have challenged this assertion, finding little or no evidence for the existence of the evil eye belief in Israel. Those passages in the Hebrew Bible that seem to mention an evil eye are, according to those scholars, idioms for greed or stinginess, not references to magical practice. I'm going to suggest here, that's the end of Tilford's quote, I'm going to suggest here that the biblical stuff is probably somewhere in between those two things idioms for greed and stinginess on one side, and then references to magical practices on the other. I, you know, I, th I think we're going to see that the biblical notion falls somewhere in the middle there. Now let's jump to the Old Testament. You have in 1 Samuel 18.9, and a number of, of studies of this, and there actually are, there are book-length studies on the evil eye in, in antiquity, uh, even some multi-volume studies. So you, you could find those on Amazon or any one of these you know, references that we'll provide here are probably going to going to note them, uh, but a, a number of them start off in the Old Testament with First Samuel eighteen nine, which which I don't think is really a a very good example, but I'm going to give it here for the sake of being complete. We have in First Samuel eighteen nine, Saul quote set his eye, and this is literally set his eye upon David unquote. Now, 
again, I don't really think this is a very good example uh, because of, of really what we have in the Hebrew. You have a term here where, as it is in the Masoretic text, you could translate this. I'm just, I'm just translating it, looking at the Hebrew here, just sort of trying to make it somewhat literal, but, but understandable for our, for our subject matter. You could, you could translate verse 9 as something like, and it came to pass, or and it was, that Saul, and then there's the word for iniquity or, or wickedness, and then we have the direct object in David. Like, like Saul did something wickedly, did something, you know, evil. He, 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 he had some sort of evil intent toward David. Now, the word there for wickedness or, you know, evil, that sort of thing, depending on how you would, you know, which manuscript essentially, which, which reading that you would go with, there is an alternative form for this particular word that could be a, not a noun like wickedness, but could be a participle. And it, then it would refer to looking with evil intent or something like that, that there, it's, it's the idea of really, you know, for lack of a better term, it's the idea of having, having a malicious eye towards someone. And that's the way most of these articles are going to take it. They're going to go with it, with that uh, manuscript reading. And, you know, I, I don't really think this is a very good one because you do have a textual issue here. And also, it, it could just mean that, that he looked at David and, and he just, the anger in him just festered. You know, he, he just didn't like David. He, 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 you know, determined in his heart to do something, you know, evil toward David. That doesn't mean that his very gaze somehow affected David negatively. Okay, so I, I think this one's a little bit overstated. I think a better example is Balaam, which again, kind of interesting language here. If you go to Numbers twenty three thirteen, and I'm just going, I'm going to go there, just so that we can read the passage. Numbers twenty three thirteen. We know the story of Balaam. Okay, that Balak wants the prophet Balaam to curse Israel. You know, and he, he keeps trying to get get the prophet to do this, and Balaam says, "Hey, I'm only going to say what the Lord puts in my mouth." And then every time he opens his mouth, and you know, he, he can't curse Israel, but he has to bless them, and Balak gets mad and all this sort of stuff. Well, here in Numbers 23, we read this. Balak said to him, again, he's speaking to Balaam, please come with me to another place from which you may see them, or, you know, or you could translate that, that, is, that you may look upon them. You shall see only a fraction of them and shall not see them all. Then curse them for me over there. So the feeling you get from that passage is that Balak, at least, and, and we're going to look at another passage, you know, that, that it goes, I think Balaam would have thought of it this way as well, but that Balak thinks that the gaze of the prophet will help him curse Israel. In other words, it, it has something to do with, with affecting an evil outcome against the thing, in this case, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel that he's looking at. So you actually have this, this language that that Balaam you know, needs to look at them. If you go to Numbers 24, the very next chapter, uh, I'll just start at the beginning because we're going to hit verse 3 here. But in the uh, beginning of verse, uh, verse 1 here, we're in chapter 24, Numbers 24, we read, When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times to look for omens, but set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up his discourse and said, now, now catch the phrase here, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened. Okay, that's verse 3. If you go down to verse 15, we read this, Balaam's first oracle. And he took up his discourse and said, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened. So you have twice this notion that Balaam is described as this man, this, this person, whose eye is open. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, it, you know, it, it has to mean more than he's not blind or something like that, because you know, there's no indication here that, you know, that this would be any special status. Hey, we found a, we found a prophet here, one that's not blind. You know, look at that. Now, it, it, there's nothing unusual about that, but this description is unusual uh, in, in with respect to other places in the Old Testament, you know, talking about prophets, you know, good or evil. So the supposition is that Balaam's practice or his ability or his, his power or his, 
you know, his technique, you know, whatever, whatever word you, that you want to really a- apply to it, had something to do with gazing upon the subject that he was going to prophesy against. Like he, like he had to look at them. Again, he had to cast his eye on them. He had to see them. And so some have, have looked at this passage and thought, well, you know, we, we may not have the phrase evil eye here, but it, there, there, must, there, there could be something here where we're looking at an object to curse it matters. And so perhaps this is akin to the way the evil eye behaves in other ancient Near Eastern cultures, where a prophet or a, a deity or you know, some other spirit would, would send their eye out toward a thing that was cursed. In other words, either either symbolically or metaphorically, the idea of, of you know sending the eye out is 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 that they they fall within your gaze. If if you think of the Lord of the Rings here, the eye of Sauron, you know, that that kind of thing. When it when it detected you, you know, that mattered. You were affected. So that that would be the sort of the idea here. To to be to fall under the gaze of this prophet person or you know or, or the deity or whatever in the ancient Near East was not something you wanted to happen because that gave them the ability then to curse you and to affect you in some way. And so scholars, again, looking at, at Numbers 23 and 24 here, have wondered uh, in, in what they've written about this, thinking, well, this sort of sounds like that idea when it's associated here with Balaam. Now, Tilford comments on this uh, briefly, this whole idea. She writes, God's watchful gaze could bring aid to the one who sought it, Psalm 25, 18 through 20, or harm to the one who had the misfortune of falling under it, Job 40, verse, verses 11 and 12, or Habakkuk 3, 6. Now, let me, let me just read you Job 40, 11 through 12. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. So Tilford is is making the point that you know sometimes God is described in this way where where God's mere look is going to affect someone either positively or negatively and that would be consistent with the you know the evil eye idea uh, in the ancient Near East and so in, in her discussion here is this is this why Balaam is described the way he is like do certain prophets kind of imbibe in this or or, or, or mimic this kind of idea where the deity in this case in the case of Job 40, it's the God of Israel here, that, that he can look at someone and, and that results in a judgment. Okay, that idea. So is, is the talk about Balaam the same sort of thing? Now she continues, Job specifically asked God to look away from him so that he can have a brief respite from his troubles, the implication being that God's sight itself brings harm. That's Job 7.19. Sight also had the power to affect the perceiver. Sight could also transfer physical properties between entities, apparently. Thus, in 2 Kings 2, 9-15, through 15, Elisha absorbs the prophetic power of Elijah by seeing him ascend. And in Numbers 21, 9, a person who is bitten by a snake could be healed by looking at the serpent staff of Moses. Now, uh, that's the end of, of Tilford's quote on this part. Now, you know, obviously we could read those passages differently, but the point is, if we're thinking about this notion that either God or a prophet, you know, someone who is ostensibly empowered by God or, or God is working through them in a given episode, which Balaam would sort of fit because God does intervene there and prevents him from cursing Israel. In other words, when, when Balaam looks you know, at, at the people of Israel, they turn out to be blessed. Maybe his usual procedure was to, to gaze upon something, to curse it. But God is intervening to, to sort of reverse that, that process. Is, is that what we're looking at? I, I think the best we can say here is that these sorts of, of passages and these sorts of statements, whether they be about God or about Balaam, are, are similar to, they're, they're, they're consistent with, might be a better way to put it, they're consistent with the evil eye idea. It doesn't necessarily mean that that the writer was was thinking about what he was writing the same way as maybe some guy over in Mesopotamia or over in Egypt, but the, the language is, you know, there there is an overlap here. There there is some consistency to it, and as we keep going, you'll see that you know this this kind of works itself out in some other places too. 
Now, there are more specific biblical references to the evil eye than these, the ones we've, we've talked about already, where you actually have the phrase uh, in, in Hebrew, evil eye. You have the word for eye and the adjective for evil. Okay? So Proverbs 23, 6. Now, you're not going to hear this in the translation. The translation is basically going to obscure this, this kind of language because it's, it's not going to be rendering it literally. It's going to be rendering the phrase interpretively. And, you know, just on a recent podcast episode, we talked about translation and how difficult that is and how, you know, the translators can influence the way people think about a certain passage. Here you go. This is a good example. So Proverbs 23, 6, do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Literally, that verse actually says, do not eat the bread of or with the evil eye. Do not eat bread with the evil eye. Do not eat the bread of the evil eye. You could translate it either way. You say, well, how in the world does somebody take that? Do not eat the bread of the evil eye or with an evil eye. And how do you get, do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy? Well, just hold on. We'll, we'll, we'll see how, how translators sort of drift over into that sort of direction. Proverbs twenty eight twenty two, a stingy man hastens after wealth. The text literally says, a man with an evil eye hastens after wealth. Deuteronomy fifteen nine. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, The seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cries it to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. Now, literally, it says, instead of your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, it's your eye does evil on your poor brother. Now, that, again, that, that is, is very, that language is very, again, reflective, similar to the kind of language you would see in other literature about, you know, someone's gaze affecting someone else negatively. You know, this, this evil eye idea, again, without the magical incantations, you know, idea, that stuff. That, that phrasing is actually pretty similar. Deuteronomy 28.54, the man who is the most tender and refined among you will begrudge food to his brother to the wife he embraces and to the last of the children whom he has left. And it's describing some you know, desperate circumstances here. And basically, the people are going to act poorly, badly, selfishly. And you know, in this case, instead of the man who is the most tender and refined among you will begrudge food to his brother, it's he will do evil with his eye against his brother and to the wife, you know, against the wife he embraces and against the last of the children whom he has left. So you have four references here that, again, the phrasing is really interesting because it does sound similar to, or at least consistent with, this concept, again, that, that's pretty much ubiquitous in the ancient world uh, in, in all eras, frankly, and even, you know, in, in what we would consider today the biblical lands, even in modern times, you know, people are still, you know, thinking this way, thinking about the evil eye. And, and here you have four references, again, that are, are kind of consistent with that. Now, Tilford uh, back to her article. Here, here's what she notes, a few things that she notes about these passages. She writes, the mention of the evil eye in Proverbs is an idiom denoting a person who is stingy. Again, this is sort of the, the standard view she's getting into. Unlike a person who has a good eye, that is a person who is generous. Proverbs 22, verse 9, you know, sort of gives us the reverse. Here, here's what the verse says. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Okay. So that's a good eye. You're 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 a sharing person. An evil eye is, you don't you're not. You know, you're greedy. So the person with a bad eye refrains from helping his or her neighbor. He offers food and drink, but does not wish his guests to enjoy them. Proverbs twenty three six and seven. He strives to obtain goods, but does not share them. Proverbs twenty eight twenty two. The references in Deuteronomy are probably also idiomatic. When disaster comes, the one who quote does bad with the eye unquote, withholds food from his neighbor, wife, and children in order to preserve his own life. Now, neither phrase refers to the physical harm caused to another by means of the eye. They refer to the individual's moral character. But Tilford is going to transition on and say, that's all true, but it's only part of the picture. It's only part of the story. These idioms do, however, derive from the affective nature of physical sight. 
either the ability of sight to affect its object or its perceiver, the one who sees the eye, okay? Presuming that the eye can affect the object of its gaze, the Deuteronomic passage map passages map the effects property on to the abstract experience of selfishness. Let me read that again. Presuming that the eye can affect the object of its gaze, the Deuteronomic passages map the effects the the the, the property. I'm I'm just going to take I'm going to improve on her wording here a little bit. The Deuteron- Deuteronomic passages map over the properties, okay, the properties of, of the gaze onto the abstract experience of selfishness. Withholding food from another, even if due to dire straits, becomes a visual activity, a doing bad with the eye. A similar sentiment is found in Proverbs 10.10. There it is noted that whoever, quote, literally, bites with the eye, gives injury. Although often translated as wink, the Hebrew verb here, karatz, literally means to bite or sting, again, with the eye. Thus, as other scholars, as she quotes um, Katze, Zacharias Katze, argue, the action of the eye described here is like to that of a devouring animal or stinging insect. It goes forth and bites its object, causing injury. To bite with the eye, then, reflects the hostile intent of the individual, a desire to negatively affect the person upon whom the glance falls. She has a cross-reference here. See also the sharpened eyes in Job 16.9. I'll read you the passage. He has torn me in his wrath and hated me. He has gnashed his teeth at me. My adversary sharpens his eyes against me. Unquote. So, you know, Tilford's point here in all this is that, look, we can read these passages and, and sure, they, they reflect stinginess, they reflect greed, they reflect selfishness. There's no doubt about that. And so translators, when they don't render these things literally, that's the flavor they're looking for. And it, it's legitimate. But her argument is that, you know, some of the language just goes a little bit farther than that, where uh, apparently the person who is doing the stingy act or being greedy is actually, according to a literal reading of the text, looking at a person with hostile intent. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withhold this to get you or to get even or to hurt you or harm you. And so, so she says it's not really sort of this passive thing that people do without thinking because they're just inherently selfish. She's arguing that, that you know, that there's, there's just something a little more active, a little more intentional, a little more deliberative to it. And the fact that this is conveyed with the language of the eye or the eyes in her, in her view, you know, reflects this idea. It reflects very generally uh, the, the notion of the evil eye, that, that the look of a person can cause harm or, or, or that it, it, you know, a person looks at another person a certain way to affect them negatively. Again, the evil eye idea. Now, the New Testament, we get some of this as well in some surprising places. In Matthew 6, 22 through 23, this is what we read. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Parallel passage to this, again, you know, Jesus is the speaker, obviously. Luke eleven thirty four through 36 says this, Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your, when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad or again evil, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. It's an odd phrase. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. That's the end of the passage. Now, the vast majority of commentators here, at least the ones you know I've looked at, would say something like, the eyes are like a window, letting light in. But that's a modern view of the eye. Okay, that, that's an interpretation of, of the language of these passages based on modern knowledge of how the eye works. They didn't have that modern knowledge. Okay? 
this is a modern view of the eye. Ancient Jewish texts, again, operating from a pre-scientific perspective here about how an eye actually works you know, mechanically, ancient Jewish texts have a different view. If there is light within, light will show from the eye. Consider the consistency of this idea when juxtaposed with the lamp idea in the same passage. A lamp doesn't transmit light from another source. A lamp is its own light source. So, in other words, you know, the modern understanding of the eye, you know, light comes into the eye, it passes through, you know, the, the, the hole there, and it hits this and that, and it, you know, it sets off, you know, this or that, you know, part of the eye, and you're able to see, you know. Okay. That isn't what the, what the passages are talking about, because, again, that pre presupposes a modern knowledge of how the eye works. Rather, the eye is the one giving off the light, okay? Um, the, you know, if there's light within, the light will show from the eye. The light comes from the eye. Again, it, it sounds a little bit like that energy stuff you know, that Plutarch was talking about, but again, we, that would be an overstatement as well, I think. We'll, we'll get to, to why in a moment. But if you juxtapose the, the talk about the eye with the lamp, it, it's kind of obvious. A lamp doesn't, doesn't receive energy, you know, light from another source and then cast it out to illumine the room. The light is the source. Okay, the lamp is the source of the light. So the eye is the source of the light, to, again, to keep the, the comparison you know, consistent. Now, I'm going to read something here from, or reference something anyway, from the International Critical Commentary here that I think goes along with this. Just a brief comment. It says, there are se several Jewish texts, roughly half a dozen of them, which liken the eye to a lamp, namely in Daniel 10.6. And in Zechariah 4, Daniel 10, 6, I'll just read that one. His body, this is the, uh, again, a, a, a reflecting a divine being here or describing a divine being. His body was like barrel, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches. Again, the idea of, you know, the eye emitting light. Zechariah 4 is another. The Testament of Job, 2nd Enoch 42, 3rd Enoch 35. Again, th th this idea is contained in Old Testament and Second Temple Jewish texts, and even, even a little bit beyond the Second Temple period. That's his point. Now, the writer says, the comparison, you know, this light, the, the eye and the lamp, the comparison in these passages never has to do with the eye conveying light to the inward parts, like, like letting light in, but again, the modern view of the eye. On the contrary, in all six instances, it is used to create the picture of, a, of light coming forth from the eye. Again, it, it's just an interesting observation. The idea then is that the eye emits okay, what is within already. So in these passages in the Gospels, Jesus is contrasting the, in Greek, the aplus, the haplus eye, single, sound, or generous eye, that you can translate haplus in any, one, any number of those ways. He's contrasting that eye with the paneros eye, the evil eye. Paneros is, is just a standard word for evil. They are contrasted, hence their meanings need to make contrastive sense. We saw in the Old Testament that the evil eye has something to do with stinginess or hostile intent, disregard for the, the person being gazed at. The way one looks at someone else affects them. It, it, it can cause them harm because they suffer as a result of the disdain or the hostility. Now, you know, they're obviously going to suffer if you withhold something from them or if you act, do you do something after your gaze and you know, the way you look at them. But let's let's think of it this way: people can actually be harmed by the way you look at them, and and that's you know that's not you know the standard evil eye thing in the in the in the pagan world where we're talking about spells and all this kind of stuff. But we know from experience that we can be affected by the way people look at us, and, and so that that that's kind of what what's in play here. We don't we don't want to forget about that. Now, there's another aspect to this that. So, several of the authors bring up, you know, I think Feensy's article is, is the one that does the most with this, even though several of them mention it. And that is, this is also part of the larger cultural picture that anthropologists and biblical scholars you know, who, who take a look at this sort of thing, uh, who, who do what in academia is called a social scientific approach to, to um, you know, reading scripture. And that is the shame on our culture. Which is is pretty important. We you know a lot of a lot of cultures today operate based on shame honor, 
systems in the Middle East, especially, but you have Asian uh, cultures that are going to do this as well, Asian and South Asian. Asian. Let me just read a little bit from Fiency's article so you get the idea. The evil eye grows out of the core Mediterranean values of honor and shame and something called the limited good. Honor is the greatest value in this society. I always think of the Japanese when I think of an honor, honor culture, shame honor culture. But anyway, back to the, to the quote. Honor is the greatest value in this society, and the worst horror is shame. Likewise, in a peasant culture, there is a sense of limited good. Food is limited, space is limited, even honor is limited. Thus, if someone has too much wealth, too much food, or too much honor, then he's taking away from you. There's only a limited amount to these things. You know, you, you can get yours taken from you. This causes envy, and envy leads to the evil eye, the putting of a curse or spell on the one who has too much or flaunts too much of what he has. Today, Mediterranean people do not, for example, like their children to be praised too much in public as beautiful or intelligent, because that might provoke the evil eye from someone else and cause a curse to be put on their children. Not everyone casts the evil eye on others. Only envious people would do that. But there are plenty of envious people to go around in any culture. Jesus saying now takes on a different meaning, it, again, in, in, this, in this context. It is not the light coming into the eye that is the issue, but what goes out from it. The hopless person or good person, sound person, is a person who has no double motives. Such a person is single-minded. No envy lurks in the shadows. What appears to be actually is. This person's gaze, again, the hop loose eye, the sound eye, the good eye. This person's gaze causes genuine good to others. However, the one with the evil eye causes evil. This one is envious of another's success or possessions or family, and either quietly or audibly casts a spell on him or her. This is a dangerous person whose whole body is in darkness or evil. In other words, when they cast the evil eye against a person, it, it, what they're casting is what's inside them. What's inside them is darkness. Now, another article by Bridges picks up on this idea, and I want to include a, a little bit of what, what this one says. Recent scholarship has documented the aspect of the ancient Mediterranean worldview, which some call the idea of limited good. In a world where people believe the good things of life existed in short supply, one person's prosperity meant another person's poverty. One person's honor meant another's dishonor. The pie, to use a modern metaphor, contained only so many slices. And if one person got a bigger slice, someone else necessarily got a smaller one. In such a world, the vice of envy ran rampant. And envious people might cast the evil eye on neighbors who made them jealous by prospering at their expense, or as they thought. Hence, the evil eye becomes associated with envy. In other words, this is why it's, it's associated with envy in, in, in Middle Eastern culture. You look bad at a person, you, you, you give them the evil eye because they have some, if they have something, it was taken from you. If they are something that you're not, okay, that was something that they took from you. It, it, it just, it, like he says, it's an inherently envious s sort of system. If you think that things are in limited supply and the, and the person who you know, has wealth or who has honor, you know, we, we can't be happy for them because the more honor they have, the more wealth they have, the more whatever they have, that was something taken from you. And in, in that cultural system, you would, you would look at them with envy. You would look at them wanting their downfall. You would look at them in such a way that you want to take from them. And this is where the, the, the evil eye mindset comes from and why it's linked in an ancient document like the Bible, you know, with envy and greed and, and so on and so forth. And again, what, what Jesus is saying, you know, the person with the hop loose eye, what comes out of their eye tells us who they really are, tells us what's really inside them. And the person with the evil eye, well, it tells us the same thing, doesn't it? it? Tells us what's inside them. One who envied, this is back to Bridges, one who envied a neighbor's prosperity might cast a withering look in the neighbor's direction in an attempt to undo the neighbor's success. In such a social context, the evil eye became an idiom for the kind of greedy, grudging, self-serving attitude Jesus contrasts with the generous eye, the hopless eye. To take evil eye as an idiom in Matthew 6, 22 through 23 does not mean to deny that people of Jesus' time believed in the harmful effects of a baleful look, just 
you know, on its own. Both people who believed in the evil eye and people who did not could use the expression as an idiom for greed. To make a modern comparison, both people who believe in ghosts and those who do not can use the expression, you look like you've seen a ghost. Belief or disbelief in ghosts does not change the figurative nature of the language. So let's move to Galatians 3. This is, this is I think, in all the sources, again, that I've looked at, is probably the example that most scholars consider the best one as far as the one that gets closest to evil eye thinking in in non-biblical culture. Okay, non, non-biblical civilizations, non-biblical peoples, in other words, the, the, the pagans, that kind of idea. This passage gets gets the closest to it. So in Galatians 3 1, and remember, you know, what's this is Paul, Paul's letter to the Galatians. What's the context? The context is Paul's opposition to converts, people that he's one of the Lord or somebody else is one of the Lord, being enslaved by the idea that either obedience to the rules of a pagan faith, you know, means salvation, or if there are Jews in the mix, the belief that obedience to the law brings salvation. He doesn't want people enslaved by these ideas. Again, this this sort of work salvation sort of thing on, on either side. So he writes in Galatians 3, verse 1, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? The, the verb there is baskino. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now made being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So, you know, he, he turns, you know, again, to the, to the typical, the fundamental, you know, Jewish example there. But the key phrase is here, who has bewitched you? The term, the verb here, boskino, is rare. This is its only use in the New Testament. It shows up twice in the Septuagint. One of those is a non-canonical book, Sirach 14.6, at least non-canonical, again, for Protestants. Sirach 14.6, and it's, it's kind of vague. Uh, it, it doesn't really tell us you know, much you know, about what's going on here. There's, one, there's no one more evil than him who begrudges himself, and this is the repayment of his evil. Okay, that doesn't really tell us much. That's Sirach 14.6. However, the second one is really interesting, and it's a passage we've actually you know, run into already. It's Deuteronomy 28.54. And I'm going to read 54 and 55 here. The tender one who is among you and the very delicate one will begrudge with his eye his brother and the wife in his bosom and the remaining young children who were left behind. And this is a different translation, ESV. Let me read it again. The tender one who is among you and the very delicate one will begrudge with his eye his brother and the wife in his bosom and the remaining young children who were left behind. The, the term begrudge there is the one translated in the Septuagint with boskino, the, the bewitching verb, okay, which, which really, you know, think about that. Tender one who's among you, the very delicate one, will bewitch with his eye his brother and the wife and his... You know, I mean, you get the flavor here of, of this being an evil eye, like, like for real, you know, kind of thing going on here. Verse 55, though, so the, the one who begrudges or bewitches with his eye you know, his his brother, his wife, the remaining children, verse 55, so as to give one of them from the flesh of his young children, whom he may be devouring, because there's nothing left behind for him in your distress and in your oppression that your enemies afflicted you in all your cities. This is a reference again to judgment for apostasy and things get so bad that we have cannibalism. And you say, what in the world is going on here? Why would Paul use this really rare term Okay, just it's the only time it's used in the New Testament, twice in the Septuagint. One is kind of neutral, but the Deuteronomy 2854 one is kind of really gross. Okay, kind of it's it's in a it's in a pretty terrible context. Why would Paul use this term in Galatians 3 1? Now some scholars think Deuteronomy 28 is the answer to that question. And yet another article by Eastman entitled The Evil Eye and the Curse of the Law, Galatians 3 1 Revisited. This is the journalist for the study of the New Testament. In 2001, Eastman writes this, 
Paul's use of the verb baskino here is unique in his letters. As in all of the New Testament, the verb's rarity makes its occurrence at such a critical juncture striking. Is it possible that Paul's peculiar description of his Galatian converts here in Galatians 3.1 might contribute in a particular way to his argument in chapters 3 and 4 at large of his letter? My argument, Eastman's, will be that the verb baskino does indeed function within Paul's appeal to his Galatian converts but as an intertextual echo, which evokes the Deuteronomic curse in which it occurs in Deuteronomy 28. Whether through the preaching of the law inscribing teachers who have come into the Galatian churches, or through Paul himself, the Gentile converts have learned about the blessings of obedience and the curses for disobedience to the law of Moses set forth in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. Among those curses is one in which starving parents in a besieged city, quote, cast the evil eye on their next of kin. Deuteronomy 28, 53-57 describes the cannibalistic actions of such parents. And again, just to, we're, we're going to quote it again, but we'll, we'll, this is more reflected in the Septuagint here. You will eat the offspring of your body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God gave you, in your distress and the affliction with which your enemies afflict you. And here's the verse 54, the one we've read a couple times now. The tender and very delicate man among you will cast the evil eye. Again, the verb is baskino, and, and with, with the word ophthalmo, get an eye, will bewitch with the eye, or cast the bewitching eye, or something like that. Cast the evil eye on his brother, and on the wife in his bosom, and the remaining children which may be left with him, so as not to give one of them any of the flesh of his children which he is eating. And the tender and very delicate woman among you, continues in Deuteronomy 28, whose foot never ventured to tread the ground because of her delicacy and tenderness, will cast the evil eye, again, Baskino, on her husband, in her bosom, and on her son and her daughter, and the afterbirth, which comes out between her thighs and the child which she bore, for she will eat them secretly in her need of all things, in your distress and your affliction with, with which your enemies will afflict you in all your cities. That's the end of the passage. Now, Eastman says, if indeed Paul's use of Boscaino in Galatians 3.1 echoes the horrifying curse, okay, the horrifying curse described in Deuteronomy 28, 53-57, how would such an association contribute to Paul's argument against those who preach works, against those who preach law observance? I propose that it operates on two levels. First, in the immediate argument about blessing and curse in Galatians 3, 1-14, and second, in the larger development of the complex imagery of parents and children, slaves and heirs woven throughout chapters 3 and 4. That is, Paul appropriates the vivid context of Boscaino for his own argument and uses it to introduce both the theme of blessing and curse, which he develops in Galatians 3, 8 through 14, and a horrifying image of the consequences of the curse of the law. On the first level, as an echo of Deuteronomy 28, Galatians 3, 1 might be translated like this, you foolish Galatians. Who has put you under a curse? In other words, that's the idea of bewitching. Who has put you under a spell, under a curse? You before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This anticipates the theme of the curse in Galatians 3, 10 to 14, and Christ crucified as the cursed one who is the antidote to the curse in the same passage. The translation of Boscaino simply as bewitched in the sense of a harmful, sinister, or jealous gaze would imply that Paul holds up the cross of Christ as an antidote to the evil eye, similar to the protection afforded by amulets, incantations, and gestures. I'm going to stop there. You see what he's saying here? He's saying Paul uses this really rare verb drawn from this horrific passage in Deuteronomy 28 for a couple of reasons. He wants the Galatians to think of the people telling them that they need to observe the law to be saved as casting a spell on them, like it's witchcraft. Okay? And, and, and he draws on the, the idea of the evil eye as part of a witchcraft tradition, like in ancient Mesopotamia, to do that. In other words, there was Israelites, people, Jews, knew where the evil eye came from. They knew it was associated with witchcraft and sorcery. You know, in, in, in their thinking, yeah, it was associated with, you know, greed and selfishness and whatnot. And you know, if you look at someone askance or you look at someone with evil intent, you know, it, it's because 
you think they stole from you, you know, it's, it's the shame honor thing, you know, all that, all that social stuff is, is relevant. But, but the argument here is that Paul, when, when Paul uses this, this verb, and especially drawn from this, this horrific passage about cannibalism, it, it's as though he's trying to say, you know, p- for people to, to, to do this kind of thing described in Genesis, in Deuteronomy 28, I mean, you, you, you gotta be, you gotta be so desperate or, or really, you have to be controlled by evil. You have to be like under a spell or something to behave this way. And so that's why he uses it. He wants the Galatians to think of the Judaizers, you know, dare I say the Hebrew roots people, as though they're casting spells. They're, they're putting people under, under, under some spell to convince them to turn away from the gospel and, and trust in works. And, and so Paul kind of wants to shake them up. He wants to shake up his readers with this reference you know, and creep them out, you know, but by doing it. And, you know, you, you look at that, you know, I would say this, or put it this way, if Paul's doing this, it's pretty clever. It's pretty shocking. You know, what, what he's trying to, the image he's trying to plant in their mind about what's being done to them. And then in, in Galatians 3, he's going to present, you know, you know, Christ as, as the one who breaks the spell. He's the antidote for this. He, he is, he is the one you want to, you want to, you know, avoid the evil eye, you know, you, you want to, you want to get out from under the spell. Well, the answer to that is Jesus. He's the antidote to it. He's immune from the evil eye and you belong to him. You know, it, it's just this sort of idea where Paul tries to use this, this image, you know, in, in its, in its horrific sense to make this point. Now for our purposes here, again, we're, we're not, um, I'll, I'll just give you one, one more paragraph from Eastman. He, I think he makes another really interesting point and I'll, I'll kind of summarize it here. He says, on the second level, an echo of Deuteronomy 28 in Galatians 3, one would identify Paul's missionary competitors and his opponents in Galatia, not only as bewitchers in an insulting rhetorical sense, nor simply as misers, but as those who themselves are acting under the curse of the law. They're, They're the ones who are actually bewitched. They're under the curse of the law, and they're by inflicting it on their children, their own children. You know, their the, the, the spiritual children, the, the people they're supposedly trying to spiritually nurture, they're putting them under a curse. And, and that includes the Galatians themselves. The verb baskino itself evokes images of helpless children who, according to popular evil eye belief, were especially susceptible to the evil eye. The implication is that the Galatians are acting like children. By evoking Deuteronomy 28, Paul has set the stage for this contrast. Not only are the Galatians acting like children susceptible to the evil eye, victims of it, but their very susceptibility is evidence that they are going under the curse and abandoning the blessing of the Spirit. So, you know, Paul's point is, again, he wants the Galatians to think of the Judaizers a certain way, and Paul draws on evil eye traditions to do it. And the evil eye tradition, again, is, is, is part in Deuteronomy again it's not just again it's not just that that the 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 guy in Deuteronomy 28 who's in trouble because you know the the Israel's apostatized and look our city's surrounded now by you know conquerors and God said we would be punished he would destroy the nations and drive us from our land and boy we're desperate and you know and I I'm, I'm going to like you know hoard my resources here and just kind of stick it out as long as I can and I'm going to I'm going to take from people I would otherwise give to he's saying no it's actually worse than that you the, the, it's so desperate that you would resort to something as as unthinkable as cannibalism and people again who 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 do that sort of thing it the the, the degree of desperation is is like they're not themselves anymore like they're under a spell they they are you know there's like zombified or something like that i mean it's something else is something wicked has has overtaken their senses and and they they become like animals you know they 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 don't uh, they don't behave in, in a rational sort of way and so paul wants them to think about all these things but but again to to make the point he has to draw on this notion you know ab- about the evil eye that it, it it it's something that is is more than just you know stinginess in, in certain contexts it is it is malicious it's evil it, it it's it's designed you know to to make people helpless it's designed you know to to cause them harm and again it's not that you know it's not spell casting you know none of these passages are, are are promoting the evil eye idea like like the pagans would where you know there are spells and amulets and all this other you know you know voodoo kind of stuff you know that, that goes with it 
you you don't see that in any of these passages. It's really, it's really about again someone that is is so wicked or mesmerized or desperate or brainwashed or you know whatever term helps you here you know to to think about it that that what's inside them is so dark that you know if if they could kill somebody by looking at them they'd do it you know uh, you know like our, our common expression so that that's the idea that that the evil eye passages in the old and new testament convey it. it 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 tells you about what's inside of a person and what they're what they're slaves to they they are they are imprisoned by darkness that that's what a person is you know who who thinks this way and who tries to harm people and and again does look at them you know in, in such a way to pit themselves against them you know to be malicious to them and when it comes to spiritual stuff like doctrine like paul here in galatians 3 he's 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 using it to make a theological point that you you galatians you're fools you are fools if you turn you know from the gospel to a system of works now it's like you're under a spell and you know what's going to happen to you when if if that's the the road you go down you're 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 going to die you're going to die like the helpless children in Deuteronomy 28, you're going to be, again, metaphorically here, consumed. You're done. Okay, you're done. And again, he's trying to get them to think those thoughts by appealing to that passage with its rare language and its connection to the evil eye idea. So that's, again, a pretty, I would say, a, a basic survey of the evil eye thinking. I think that's a, probably the best way to, to cast this episode. Kind of like, how does how does Scripture reflect and maybe we can add a word here, repurpose, reflect and repurpose, uh, demonstrate a sensibility to the fact that evil eye thinking was a big part of the biblical world, a you know, big part of the ancient world in which the biblical events, the biblical, biblical events take place, biblical writers do their thing. The evil eye idea was a big part of that. It was part of the culture. It was, it was very deeply embedded in the culture. And as, again, some of the, the sources we began the episode with, you know, pointed out, that it, it's it's ubiquitous. It's just all over the not only the Middle East, not only you know, the ancient Near East, but you know, even today, it's all over the world. And there are different reasons why it, it, it's all over the world. There's different there are different um, you know points to it. In antiquity, it was associated with magic. It was associated with casting spells and whatnot. Later on, it, it's going to be again this idea of of looking at a person to cause malicious intent. And and you get you get both you get flavors of both. You get a little little sprinkle of both. In the Bible, you know, you get the references to Balaam, how he would, you know, had to, had to gaze at someone to do his thing. Apparently, you know, he had to lock onto him, so to speak. Um, that there's there's some sort of, you know, perhaps witchcraft element in that, and it's Balaam. I mean, look, you know, it, it, he's not like the best example of a biblical prophet, to be sure. Um, the traditions associated with Balaam, of course, in the Moabite issue, you know, doesn't certainly doesn't improve his profile. So you you get you get some of that in it. But again, you get this 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 sense of bewitching darkness in a spiritual sense, and and in Paul's case, in a theological sense, that that you are gripped, you are you are in the grip of something that's just going to bring about your death, and and to to try to wake the Galatians up, he appeals to this passage, as awful as as it is, this this passage back in Deuteronomy twenty eight, to, to try to get them to see his point, and, but all of that again draws on the the evil eye idea in the ancient world. All right, Michael, that was kind of fun to go off the rails there a little bit and talk about something. It is an we, off the rails topic. Yeah. 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 We normally wouldn't do. So that's, it's kind of neat. I enjoyed it. Yeah. We, we could, we could do, uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, if you're going to get into like, you know, magic and divination and all that stuff, you know, we, there are plenty of places to park, um, you know, in, in all that material. So maybe at some point we'll pick another one out. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Mike. Well, next week, we've got another interview coming up. Uh, Dr. McDermott, you want to tell us about what we're talking about? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, Gerald McDermott is the guy that I've mentioned in several episodes before. He he wrote God's Rivals, which in simplistic terms is, you know, focuses on the discussion among the church fathers of why God allowed the other nations to worship other gods. Okay, so it gets into the sort of the mix of perspectives in the early church in regard to what we would call on this podcast, what I would what I have called in an unseen realm, the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. In other words, what what was what was God thinking? How you know how would this help? Did did God like plant truth into these you know, into these foreign religions and their gods and whatnot that would sort of 
plant the seeds for them to come around and, and, and recognize who the true God was? Or, or is it like a total apostasy thing here? You know, in other words, what, how would it work? How would this system somehow work itself together for good, you know, to, to, to God, you know, working with the nations, reclaiming them, so on and so forth? How, how, do, how would, should we understand this? You know, and I get questions like this, you know, in, in Q&As and, and different events, you know, and, and this book actually tells us, at least it gives us a glimpse of how the, the, the post-apostolic generation, again, the early church fathers, and, and beyond, you know, we're going to get into, you know, Middle Ages, you know, guys, theologians and whatnot, how they try to think about uh, this topic. We're also going to get into some other stuff that uh, uh, Dr. McDermott has has written about the nature of Israel, you know, how do we define Israel and all that sort of stuff. So he he's written a couple of books on things that we've talked about on this podcast before. And and God's Rivals is, is really interesting because, you know, it, it you wonder, and I get Again, emails like this all the time. Well, why? Is this like new? You know, the church fathers, they never said anything about this stuff. And well, I, yeah, actually they did. You know, they, they they didn't recognize it as well as, as we can today because they didn't have the primary sources. They didn't have those languages deciphered and, you know, all that stuff. So we we, we actually do have more material where we can pick up on, on a lot of things better than they could. But they did pick up on certain things and they did have discussions. And so I, I think... Um, I think a little foray into into church history stuff will be worth it. All right, Mike, that will be good. And this episode was fun, so we appreciate it. And I just want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.